Good morning, church. Our scripture today is from the book of Matthew. I'll be reading chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Uh, if you have a Bible, I encourage you to open it up and follow along with me. Matthew 5, beginning in verse 1. Now when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hello, church. Good to see you. A couple announcements. Uh, this coming Saturday, uh, we have a vacation Bible school. And um, those of you who have vo uh, volunteered, you need to arrive here by 9 o'clock, okay? So this coming Saturday, get up early, get to the building by 9, because we've got to set up things. And so make sure you're here for that. Um, the pro program begins at 10 sharp. Uh, you know the best advertising the church has is free. And that's you and me and our children. And so those of you who have kids who are part of this program, the best results we will have is if they bring their friends. I remember when my boys were small that they frequently would bring their friends to Vacation Bible School. So children, invite your friends to come to this coming Saturday. And invite them to come to Vacation Bible School. That's, that's the best advertising we have. Also, if you signed up to bring food, um, it needs to be here no later than 10 o'clock. Okay, so if you signed up to bring food, uh, make sure it's here by 10. Also, Sunday is going to be fellowship dinner. And we did that because of... Uh, when Vacation Bible School falls, obviously, we're going to have things set up. I think we still may have a bouncy house, Tricia, is that correct? The bouncy house will be carried over till Sunday. Lord willing, we'll have nice weather. Uh, I need grill masters for Sunday. Can I have a couple volunteers to make sure we got grills, grill masters for Sunday? I'm going to stand up here until a couple of you guys. All right, I see a couple hands. All right, you guys, Nick and Tom. Uh, make sure that you guys set us up for Sunday. All right, hamburgers and hot dogs, you guys bring side dishes. All right, the church will provide the hamburgers and hot dogs. So, uh, you know, drink and that sort of thing, it'll have to be, will have to come from us. Bring side dishes appropriate uh, for that for next Sunday. Also, uh, we need volunteers uh, for, to take care of zero to two-year-olds from 12.30 to 2.45. We need one more volunteer for that for uh, next Saturday. Also, we need uh, one more volunteer for setting up and breaking, breaking down for, to begin the program and to end the program. Um, we need one more volunteer. We need one more person volunteer to uh, grill hamburgers and hot dogs and uh, to set up food and to serve food. The list is going to go around. There's about 90 people on this side. I'll start over here. All right. We need to go. When you see that red mark, we're looking for volunteers. All right. Look it over. Think about it. Uh, get involved. Don't just come here and sit. Amen. Amen. All right. You got an opportunity to serve our Lord and worship next Saturday. So we need volunteers to help pull off our vacation Bible school when it gets to the back, you guys fellowship with this side and bring it up this way, okay? So, let's start back here. Michael, we'll start with you. <clears throat> All 
Our group got back from Haiti last night. They're very tired. Uh, several of them, I think about five were sick during the week. I think three had to have IVs. And uh, don't ask me why. I don't want to explain why. All right? And so, uh, but it was, uh, it was a good week. They, they, uh, there's some wonderful pictures. I know Donnie will share those with you. Uh, they were working on a church building up in the country, so far up, they had to cross streams to get there. And I saw a picture of a big truck this way going up a muddy hill, and it was stuck, all right? And our group of 20 people were riding on the back of that truck to get up to that church building. Um, I understand that that was an area where this Church of Christ is, is also an area where there's a, a lot of voodoo, all right? And so the church is needed, amen, in places like that. And our group went up and helped build a church building in a part of Haiti where there are people that are being influenced in paganism. And so um, I'm glad they're back. I think they're real troopers. And uh, Donnie pulled off a good event, and, and everybody, everybody that went to Haiti came back. Isn't that good? <laughs> All right? And uh, they're kind of wheezy, some of them, but they came back. And so uh, they're going to have some stories to tell and memories they'll never forget. Um, several months ago on the Today Show, um, they interviewed this fella by the name of Forrest Finn, multimillionaire from New Mexico. And um, he's dying of cancer. So he's only got a little bit of time left. But God had blessed him with a great deal of money, and so um, he thought he would come up with something creative. He wanted people to get out of the house, get away from the television, get away from their electronic devices, and go discover the world. And so in order to do this, he got a big chest, and he filled that chest with gold coins, emeralds, rubies, worth several million dollars. And he went and hid it. And now he is telling us, we're included, go find it. And he has a list. You can find this. You could go find it online and pull this up. Uh, you may want to go for a treasure hunt. And he gives nine different clues of where he buried several million dollars. And so... Uh, they, it doesn't make any sense at all to me, so good luck. <laughs> all right? But basically, he said, uh, he wrote a book, an autobiography, it's The Thrill of the Chase. And in the book, Forrest Finn says, he wants us to know how most valuable things, the most beautiful things, are not easily found. You have to go search for them. And so here you have an opportunity to become a millionaire. All you got to do is find his chest of gold. And so pull up the, the, the little poem and find the clues and, and go out for a treasure hunt. Well, starting today, I'm going to take you on a treasure hunt. And, and sometimes we're going to have to really start digging to get, really get the meaning out of it. It's not necessarily easy. In fact, it's counterintuitive. It's just the opposite of what you may think it is. Ever, some of you probably can't drive in reverse yet. But you know how, how difficult it is to learn to drive in reverse? It's just the opposite of driving forward, isn't it? That's what the word counterintuitive means. It doesn't make sense, but it works. That you steer in the opposite direction to get where you're going in reverse, right? And so it's counterintuitive. Jesus often will say things that are counterintuitive, but it works, folks. Jesus knows what he's talking about. He knows how to have a great life. Now, you're going to have to dig into it to find it. And I think in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, you see some principles of Jesus that are just the opposite of what we think. But they work if you're willing to work them. It's interesting that in Colossians 3, the Apostle Paul said, For you died, and the life you now live is hidden with Christ. 
It's also interesting that Jesus will call the kingdom of heaven a treasure that is hidden in a field, doesn't he? That it's something that you have to go look for. And that's kind of what Forrest Fenn was saying, is that the things that are very precious in life take some effort in order to find. And that's true of the Beatitudes. It's interesting, the Latin word is beatus, B-E-A-T-U-S. And that's where we get our word beatitude. It comes from that Latin word. And it's talking about attitudes that Jesus wants you and I to have in order to have an abundant life. It's found in this section of scripture called the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest recorded sermon we have of Jesus. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so that makes it special, doesn't it? It's the first sermon that we have that Jesus spoke that's recorded in scripture as well. And so he introduces his sermon with these with these beatitudes, attitudes that we need to have. Another thing that I thought was interesting that I learned this week, I didn't know this before, but rabbis back then, they would read the law, and then they would interpret it. And people were given the chance to listen to the interpretation and application, and the rabbis would have followers. Uh, Two very famous rabbis were called... uh, a Shammai and Helio. One was conservative, the other was liberal, and they had followers. What well, these rabbis, whenever they would make application to scripture, and you decided to follow them, they would call that a yoke. So if you and I just started to follow um, Rabbi Shammai and his interpretation of the law, we would say that we would put on Shammai's yoke. Or we would put on Helio's yoke. Here we are looking at Jesus' interpretation of the law. So you know what he's asking you and I to do? Put on his yoke. And you know what a yoke is? Well, some of you don't. It's that wooden thing that you would put over the neck of an animal. And you would use that to steer the animal, to direct it. So Jesus is calling you and I today to read his yoke, accept it, and do it. And so... Um, whether you like it or not, I, everybody in this room is following somebody's yoke. You're following some philosophy that you're, you're using to direct your life. I hope it's God. I hope it's scripture. But everybody here is following somebody's yoke. You're listening to some philosophy that you've accepted, and you're going to say, this is what I'm going to base my life upon, this particular interpretation of life. And so Jesus is going to give us his yoke. I hope you're willing to follow it. It's just the opposite of what you think. Um, We wouldn't say a blessed person is poor. We would basically say a blessed person is rich, right? And we often use the terms interchangeably. Let's say if you go to somebody's house and they've got a great house or they have a wonderful car. That person doesn't usually say, I'm rich. What do they usually say? I am blessed. And we often equate wealth with being blessed. But what did Jesus say? Just the opposite. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So what is he talking about? What is this poor in spirit? I think John 10 is another way of looking at it. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. Someone who is poor in spirit is somebody who is blessed by God. And and that he's trying to get you to have an abundant life. I came up with this definition. A blessed life is living with a God-given joy and satisfaction regardless of of our outward conditions, regardless of our outward conditions, we can still be a blessed person. You know what I heard from Jeremy already? That Haiti is very poor, more so than you guys realize, okay? Except the group that went there. But I've already heard Jeremy say this last night when I picked them up. They seem to be so happy. 
that even though they were extremely poor, there is a joy and a community that they had that Americans are missing. That's counterintuitive. That's just the opposite of what we think it should be. And so that's what Jesus is calling us to. That's part of his yoke. He says, like, you want to be an abundant person? You want to live an abundant life? Take my teachings on. And what are they? Here they are. Blessed are... That's how he starts his sermon. That should tell you it's pretty important, right? He starts his sermon with these words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I know what some of you are thinking. I've got this because I'm poor. You know? That I am good, right? Well, it's more than that. It's much more than that. And so, actually, the word that he uses, there's two Greek words for poor. This particular word means destitute, bankrupt. That's the word that Jesus uses. That a person who is blessed is someone with poor, with a whole bunch of O's to it. Poor, you know? That they are destitute. They have nothing. So what does it mean, folks? I understand that people who are homeless have been asked this question. What is the hardest part about being homeless? And uh, one common answer is not that the nights are cold or we don't have a proper food. You know what the common answer is? Of why, why uh, you know, what's most, so difficult about being homeless? This is what most people will say. Asking for help. To be so poor that you have to ask somebody just to get through the day to help you. That would be humiliating, wouldn't it? To have to ask for help. And But Jesus is saying, if you get to that point, you are blessed. That if you're destitute, if you have no place else to turn. So what do we learn? It means you reach a point where you realize you're broke. And now, practically speaking, that's meaning that, look, I can't get to heaven without Jesus Christ. There's no way that I can do it in and of myself, that I am destitute, I'm bankrupt. Tim Keller said, he offers this following definition that I thought was good. It means that you are deeply in debt before God. And you have no ability to even begin to redeem yourself. God's free generosity to you at infinite cost to him is your only hope. That's being poor in spirit. Where you realize that, look, I'm in a sad shape here. Those of you who have become Christians, have you realized that? I know it when, before I became a Christian, I was destitute. I'm glad not all of you went the same journey I went, all right? That I look back at my life, how I felt, and I remember how lost I felt, how I didn't know where I was going, so much so that I ended up in a drunk tank in Defiance, Ohio, thinking, what in the world is this world about? What am I supposed to be doing here? And so I, I was at a point where I was destitute. I was bankrupt. I didn't know where to turn. I thought it was partying. Drugs and alcohol, I thought that would be the way to turn. It wasn't. And so I had to get to the point that I was flat on my back and then I started to look up. And I started praying to God and asking him for help. Tim Keller goes on to say, on the contrary, you believe that God owes you some things. He ought to answer your prayers and to bless you for the many things you've done. We can say that we are, I like this, middle class in spirit. You feel that you've earned a certain standing with God through your hard work. You also believe that success and the resources you have are primarily due to your own industry and energy. Middle class in spirit. A lot of us feel that, look, God, I go to church. I have to listen to Donnie and Jim preach. All right? That should earn me some points. You need to hear my prayer and answer it. All right? No, that's not blessed. You're blessed when you realize I'm broke. I'm lost without God. 
I'm lost without his help in my life. I am destitute. I'm poor. Ken Blanchard once said that ego stands for edging God out. I like that. That some, we become so middle class in spirit that we don't, have, we don't need God anymore. I've got it. I'm good. Have you ever met with anybody like that? Have you ever tried to study with somebody? And they feel like they've already got it? I don't need God. You see, you can't, you can't be blessed by God until you ask for his help. That is somebody who is truly blessed. And so that leads to this point. It's when you reach out, reach a point where you ask God for help. That's somebody who is poor in spirit. It's difficult in America. You know, self-help industry is an $11 billion industry. I understand that there are 45,000 self-help books. Any of you got any? All right, Idiot's Guide to Whatever, right? And, and I've got a few of those books, right? Idiot's Guide to Excel or whatever, you know? That I have to, I, th I can do this. That I, I can, you know, just give me enough time, I can do this. That's, that's the age. I can do it myself. Any of you with children, do you remember the time that the child says, I can do it? Right? And I can do it myself? Right? All right? And another thing, are the, do we give out any awards for somebody who's poor in spirit? Do we have any award banquets for that? All right, Stacy, how about somebody filling out a resume? Do, would you want that on the resume? All right, I don't know anything about this job. I need help, right? That's not going to help you, right? You want to go in and say, I could do this and a hundred other things you asked me to do, right? I can do this. Look at Nietzsche. You talk about a yoke. Remember what I said about the rabbis and taking their yoke upon them? Look at, look at Nietzsche. A philosopher, right? So some of us who have taken ethics classes, we've had to study about Nietzsche. Assert yourself. Care for nothing except for yourself. The only vice is weakness. The only virtue is strength. Be strong. Be a superman. The world is yours if you can get it. Have people put that yoke on? Yes. People follow Nietzsche's yoke, his philosophy. They will say, that's, you know, it's no, don't show your weakness. Show you're a superman, right? That's a philosophy of this world. What did Jesus say? Just the opposite. What Jesus taught was counterintuitive. Just the opposite of what we think works. Have you ever noticed how sometimes you do things you shouldn't? Any of you ever do that? Did you ever stay up late when you know you need sleep? I've, I already see that already this morning. All right? Some of you stayed up too late because you're already done. And I'm just got started. Right? Do you ever eat or drink more calories than your body needs? No, none of us ever do that. Uh, do you ever feel that you need exercise, but you don't? Do you ever look at some sexually explicit images on your computer, and you know that's immoral, but you do it anyway? Do you ever take prescription or illegal drugs, and you know you shouldn't, but you do it anyway? Have you known you should be unselfish only to act selfishly? Have you ever tried to control someone or something and found it was uncontrollable? Have you ever been tempted to do something and you knew would be self-destructive, but you did it anyway? If you answered yes to any of those, welcome to the human race. <laughs> we have all done something that we knew we should not do. You're blessed when you get to that point and your heart's broken. When your heart is broken, like, man, God, I don't know why I did that. Why did I say that? God, I need help. That's when God can bless you. That's why he begins this sermon with that point. Humility. Realizing that we need him. I like the way the message says it. You are blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. 
That's kind of what he's referring. It's counterintuitive. It's just the opposite of what works. What really works in life. You ever hear one of these surveys where people have been asked to quote your favorite verse? You know what a common response is? God helps those who... There's a problem with that. What is the problem? That is not in the Bible. But Americans know that verse. What did Jesus say? Just the opposite. God blesses those who ask for help. That's what he's saying. Those who are flat on their back, those who are poor with a whole bunch of O's that are destitute, and they're saying, God, I need help. Think of the miracles of Jesus. It's almost like he, Jesus wants to focus on those who cannot do anything to help themselves. Right? Right? you got a woman who's been bleeding for years. She's been going to doctors for help. The doctors just make her worse. She hears about Jesus and she goes and touches his garment. Remember that? And Jesus took care of a thing of a woman who was destitute. There's a centurion. His servant is sick. He's a Gentile. He hears about Jesus. He's tried everything to get help for the servant, right? But he hears about Jesus. He goes and he says, look... You're not even worthy to come to my house because I'm a Gentile. Would you just bless my servant? You know what Jesus did? Long distance cure, didn't he? And he healed that man and he wasn't even, he says, go, your servant lives. The man was destitute and God blessed him. On and on, as I look through that, God, Jesus blesses those who are destitute. That they're crying out to God and saying, I need help. There's a lovely psalm here. Look at Psalm 107 with me. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. That's a significant statement. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Look at verse 10. Some said in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. Look at verse 23. Some went out on the sea in ships. They were merchants on mighty waters. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths in their peril. Their their courage melted away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hush. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love. His wonderful deeds for mankind. What's significant? Three times, what does it say? They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. They were poor. They were destitute. They couldn't do it in and of themselves. Jesus will say in Mark 2, on hearing this, Jesus said to them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have come to call the, not not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus' ministry is to people who are poor in spirit. That's who he's able to help. And I want you to consider an example. Saul of Tarsus. I hope you have a Bible. Acts chapter 9. I'm not going to read all 18 verses. I just want to key in on a few of them. In Acts chapter 9, verse 1, it it talks about Saul, and it says, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest... And asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. I mean, this guy is arrogant, right? He's able to walk up to the high priest and speak to the high priest of Israel. So Saul was a man of influence. He was a man of clout. He hated Christians so much that he thought he should persecute them, all right? You know the story, don't you? 
He's on his way to Damascus to find Christians and to persecute them, to arrest them. A bright light comes, remember the story? And Saul of Tarsus is literally blinded, cannot see. Verse 8 says, Saul got up from the ground, knocked him to the ground. That's kind of interesting. Isn't this a paradox you see here? Saul is, had gone to the high priest to get letters with authority to arrest Christians. He's a, he's, here he is feeling big, right? He's knocked down to the ground by God. He got up from the ground, it says in verse 8. He opened his eyes. He could not see nothing. Can you imagine? That'd be scary, wouldn't it? For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Would you? I want a cheeseburger. No, not if you can't see, right? And one day you could see clearly and all of a sudden something happens. You're blind. You can't see. He's, he's fasting. He's praying and fasting for three days. God sends this message to a disciple by the name of Ananias. And he tells Ananias, I want you to go have a Bible study with the Saul of Tarsus. What does Ananias say? God, haven't you heard about this guy? <laughs> that would be like having a Bible study with Jeffrey Dahmer, right? No, you don't. You have, you, he hurts people. I, don't you have somebody nice that I can study with, you know? And Ananias is told, go. Because he is going to be my servant. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul. He said brother Saul the Lord Jesus. Who appeared to you on the road. As you were coming here. Has sent me that you may see again. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. I like the next line. He got up and was baptized. What did Ananias say in that Bible study, right? Something about the gospel. And the gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection, right? And how do you respond to the gospel? Paul tells you in Romans, right? That you're buried into his death and you're raised to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 3, and 4. Ananias had to say something like that, right? Because the next thing you hear, this guy who was blind but now can see, saying, I want to be baptized. But the thing about this story, what do I see? He had to be poor first, right? Paul had to be poor first. He had to realize that he's destitute, that he was heading in the wrong direction. He was lost and didn't even know it. And his eyes had to be open to that. I pray today, there's somebody in this room, your eyes are open to that. That you're heading in the wrong direction. That without Jesus Christ, you are bankrupt. But that's when you can become blessed. God can bless you when you're in that situation. It's interesting in Psalm 107... It gives these different scenarios of being in darkness, being out on the sea and needing help. And they called out to the God in their distress, and he, he heard them. I want to do something a little different today. We normally have just a song, an invitation, and we encourage people to respond, and we take prayer requests. We're still going to do that. I'm going to be up here. If you have something you want me to pray about, I'll be glad to do that. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be buried today, we have a big tank here for that. We will bury you into Christ and raise you up to walk in newness of life. Okay? Just like you read Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. You could do the same thing today. We have clothes and towels, everything you need to do that today. And walk home dry, but saved. All right? But maybe... I bet there's some stuff in your life where you need God's help. There's a box in the back, and there's a box here, and there's some index cards and some pencils. We're going to sing about three songs. Nick is going to lead us in three songs. If, if there's something that's heavy on your heart, it could be all kinds of things. 
say, Lord, I need your help with whatever it is. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with some kind of addiction. And you're, you're kind of keeping it in the closet. You're not dealing with it. Let it be known. The Bible says that God hears those who call out to him, right? Call out to him in our distress. Maybe there's sickness in your life. Maybe there's, there's calamity. Maybe there's just heavy burdens. You've got a prodigal child. Whatever it is. As we're singing these songs, those in the back, if you want to go back there to that back table, make room back there, Charlie and Donnie, for people to write things down, you know, and, and go back there, write it down, and put it in that box, all right? And the elders will pray over these things. You can make it anonymous. God knows, right? You may not want me to know, but you say, well, I want God to know, all right? Make it anonymous, if you have, as we're singing these songs, if, you're, if, if it's in your heart to call out to God, Lord, I need help with, write it down, all right? And put it in the, let's stand and worship God right now in song. First song will be 454. 454. Feel free, as we're singing, to walk up to either one of these tables and write things down, folks. 454. Rock of ages. 